All right. Before we get started, we always want to do a weekly spotlight on some Green Home Institute members. So this one, we're excited to uh, point out that Slipstream, one of our new members, is really wondering if you or someone you know has the technical experience of installing, designing, and coordinating residential HVAC system installations in cold weather climates. Green Home Institute is very excited to see this position get filled in advanced cold weather climate heat pump systems. You can go to slipstreaminc.org uh, uh, about careers to learn about this opportunity and many other opportunities they have coming up. This is who Green Home Institute members are. This is what Green Home Institute members do. So can you go to greenhomeinstitute.org slash become a member. And before we get started as well, a thanks to our top uh, uh, gold level sponsor, Panasonic. Panasonic has launched their new energy recovery ventilator ERV in telebalance, which can now get up to 200 CFM of air, so 60 to CFM. And they work with smart system technology to only exhaust air when higher levels of humidity or VOCs are detected. These are Energy Star certified and they have cold weather climate models. I have one and I can tell you from this most recent experience of the cold snap that we hit, I looked at my air quality data in my house and I saw that air quality was still good. It was still running even in the coldest temperatures here in Michigan. So check them out at greenhomeinstitute.org slash ERV200. All right, well, welcome everyone to modular housing uh, and Zero Energy Ready. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. We're a small team, and today I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the education manager here. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, including our certified Green Home professional designation and at least four of the pillars of green. AIA, health, welfare, and safety, make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license, as well as um, passive house uh, CEUs, missed the screenshot there, uh, will be available for certified passive house um, consultants. So with that, I am super excited to hand it over to our speaker today, um, Ankur from Module. Um, Ankur, I'm so glad you could join us. Welcome, and please take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Brett, for the introduction. But uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody um, coming in and also appreciate um, Brett for the opportunity to be in front of everyone and um, kind of talk through the experience um, that me and my team have had uh, over the past few years as it relates to modular housing and building zero energy ready homes. Um, I am going to start uh, sharing. Um, uh, my slides, so just give me a second. All right, uh, Brett, if you can just let me know real quick if you see it. Yep. All right, um, great. So um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ankur Dobriyal, um, Director of Offsite Innovation at Module, um, currently a Pittsburgh-based um, design build firm um, doing modular zero energy ready housing. Uh, my background is civil engineering um, and construction management from Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, I've been in the modular space uh, for about six years now. Um, I did start out with module as well, and we've come um, a long way since then, uh, still in our ramp up phase. But um, yeah, I've been. Uh, building a few homes here in Pittsburgh. If um, any of you obviously have a chance, uh, would love to give you a tour sometime. I'll have my contact details at the end of this presentation. Um, but yeah, let's uh, get started um, in terms of um, questions and stuff. Um, uh, I think we can, uh, I'm, I'm all okay answering a few of those uh, as we go through the presentation. I think this being a conversation rather than um, just a presentation is probably um, the best way to go and uh, feel free um, to send your questions in the chat and, and I know Brett's going to be uh, monitoring that. So as a lot of you know, um, given the background um, that I see in the chat, 
Um, you know, I think everybody's facing these three major problems in the industry currently. We have a supply shortage um, that only got worse after uh, COVID. Uh, we have a labor shortage. 40% uh, of the construction workforce is set to retire in the next few years. Um, and uh, obviously, we have the climate crisis um, coming up as well, um, or we're kind of already in it. Uh, but depending on where you are, you might feel different effects of it um, already. Uh, and then, you know, construction actually contributes to about 40% of the global emissions um, as well. Um, especially coming from a city like Pittsburgh, uh, where the air quality and those kind of things haven't always been the best. And that's something that has been top of mind uh, for us as well. Uh, and uh, also the increasing cost of um, maintaining and running a household um, as it relates to energy consumption has gone up recently as well. And so um, doing what we do, um, I think building to those standards that are better, I'm always trying to do better on the climate side as well, um, is something that we're heavily focused on. In terms of labor shortage, and for example, in a city like Pittsburgh, I'm sure, in cities, in a few uh, areas that you guys are at as well, um, it's probably very high, uh, hard to find good quality um, subcontractors, whether it's for framing or drywall or anything like that, um, or the good ones are all scheduled out for months. Just this morning, we we're trying to hire one of our preferred um, drywall contractors, and and they um, aren't free until end of July, I think, is the, is the date Gia gave me. So that kind of just, you know... Um, <laughs> gets the point home in terms of where we are at. So one solution that um, I have been focused on and um, my team has been focused on um, has been um, an on-electric product. Uh, so something that um, comes to mind is it obviously Zero Energy Ready program and the Energy Star program, which a few of you are familiar with. I, I think I also saw a couple of um, raters um, in the chat as well. Um, but the solution that we've been focused on is an all electric urban product. Uh, we um, have a focus pretty much on the Northeast and I have been looking at different markets sort of um, south and to the west of Pittsburgh as well. But for the most part, we've been looking at the Pittsburgh market. Um, so any data that I present um, is going to be based on case studies that were performed in Pittsburgh. So I think um, moving forward, that might be a good uh, thing to just keep in mind. Um, so the homes that we're building or that are being built to Zero Energy Ready standards, like if you become a member of the Zero Energy Ready Certified Builder Partnership, um, you are going to have a lot of resources at your disposal. Um, the homes are anywhere between 50 to 80 percent more efficient than um, a average port built home I think for the zero energy ready program that's kind of been um, an ongoing focus to be um, ahead of the code by about that much and then the other focus um, especially on our side has also been to reduce the life cycle cost of the home and make it easy to maintain and run and I think that's um, been something that um, not just me or my colleagues, but like a lot of folks in um, the industry have also been looking at is how do we reduce the life cycle costs of the home as people can afford a much smaller house than they could before or can um, afford much less in, in utilities and other things than they could before. How do we make it more accessible um, uh, to people? Now, just a couple of numbers on this sheet, 40% faster build. Like what does that actually mean. 40% um, faster to build doesn't necessarily mean that modular homes can be built 40% faster. Um, they do get built significantly faster. There are um, factories that can build a home uh, within a week. Um, however, there are a lot of other gains in terms of not having any weather delays because the modular homes are built in a controlled environment. Um, work can go on in parallel while you're doing your foundations. The homes are being built in a factory. Um, so the work is going on in parallel and that saves a lot of time um, when it comes to site work. And then um, on modular 
on the modeler side of things, since all your subcontractors are on the floor as employees, there is no scheduling of contractor and then waiting for the next subcontractor to come in. It's just a much smoother process um, and a much faster process. So all those things kind of contribute to the speed of construction. In terms of what does 80% more energy efficient mean? Um, obviously the energy bills are low, but what is that or how does that happen? Um, Zero Energy Ready uh, comes up with very stringent standards on every update that they have out. I think the latest update uh, would be us building to 2021 ICC. A lot of the states are still on 2015 or even 2012, or some of them are on 2018. So it's always sort of a step up to try um, and build to those standards. Uh, but generally speaking, I think it's just a better built house. You know, you have, um, the house is better sealed, better insulated. Um, the inspections are more um, throughout the process opposed to at the end of or at milestones. Like you can, because these are built in a factory, there can be constant monitoring and, and upkeep of the information or the way the homes are being built. And then these being built in a climate control environment kind of eliminates any exposure during construction to the elements. And that definitely... Um, makes for a better product at the end of the home um, or at the end of the home construction. So uh, it's a quick um, view of, of how a modular home is set for, for uh, folks that may have not been to a modular home set before, uh, but essentially the homes um, are built in um, cuboidal sections, uh, shipped to site, they can be as wide as 16 feet in most states. And some states even allow it to go wider, 18 or 20 feet. Um, and then when they're on site, they're lifted by a crane and placed on top of foundations. They can be any size, um, two to three stories high for the most part on single family homes, uh, multifamily. Um, there are a few skyscrapers that are now being built uh, with modular uh, method as well. Um, in terms of costs, they're roughly uh, anywhere between 100 to 140, 100 to 140 uh, dollars a square feet. Now, again, that depends on the size of the home. Uh, if you build a small accessory dwelling unit in the back, the number is going to be significantly higher than that. If you big up, if you build a 5,000 square feet mansion, the number is going to be significantly lower um, than 100 as well. So it really depends on how concentrated uh, the more expensive areas of your home is, like depending on Actually, irrespective of the size of the home you build, um, you're still going to have a kitchen and a bathroom or a couple of bathrooms. And so those are the more expensive areas of that house. And so the bigger you build, the square feet number goes down. And that's the same for modeler as well. Uh, in terms of on-site set of these homes, which is what was on the screen, um, the fastest homes that I've seen set um, for a three-story house, let's say, is a couple of hours. So you can do two to four homes uh, per day if the weather permits, obviously. Um, and I think depending on the layout and um, how the homes are designed, um, you could even achieve a higher number than that if everything falls in place. So I think um, setting is uh, a lot of planning. And so six to 10 boxes is sort of what most people aim at to be able to set one day. Like this picture on the screen, you see that house is actually two boxes. And so something like this, which would be three homes on three different foundations, we could be um, setting in one day. So I also wanted to talk about a business model for um, generally building affordable housing that, that we have seen. Um, people adopting. Um, most of the times, um, there is no naturally occurring affordable housing in cities such as Pittsburgh. What, what that means is you build a um, new construction house, it is going to be at a cost that is higher than what an affordable household, which typically would mean 80% area median income or below can afford. Um, what that means is that the construction cost in that city or area are higher than what an average home buyer can afford. Um, in that case, a lot of the affordable housing providers 
um, have the capacity um, to then work with the city or state to essentially subsidize the construction. And so, and also bring scale to the whole process, like selling to individual home buyers and going through that process is typically time consuming. So housing providers um, kind of assemble uh, a few different sites together and uh, then come to a modeler manufacturer or a modeler builder um, to purchase the homes from them. So that's been a model um, of choice for a lot of developments going on um, in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic is um, housing providers um, taking care of the entitlements and land acquisition, and then the modeler providers or the modeler contractors um, building the home for them. And then there is a state or city level subsidy um, that is um, used to bring the price of that home uh, where it can be sold to an 80% or below um, area, area income buyer. Um, and the typical process for that is um, or can be categorized into roughly three categories. Um, one is pre-development, uh, which is essentially just the feasibility phase of the project. And now why that is important is because a lot of times um, housing providers aren't ready to get into high amount or high dollar amount contracts and the feasibility study kind of gives them a nice uh, first step to assess uh, their site. Um, they can assess the team uh, the construction team put all the um, missing pieces together but then on the flip side it also allows uh, the designers or the builders to assess the developer and their capacity and um, it's sort of like a two-phased feasibility approach and um, it's a really good um, half step before getting into a full design contract because a lot of these housing providers especially on the affordable housing side um, do not commit to any larger contracts until they have their financing ready. And what they need for financing is typically just a basic set of drawings and numbers which come out of the feasibility study phase. Um, and the next step, um, which everybody on the call is probably familiar with is pre-construction, which is the design and permitting phase. Essentially, um, in pre-construction, uh, the as far as the modular piece of it is concerned, um, the modular components are designed and then certified um, at the state level. Uh, now, different states work differently um, in terms of how their approvals are carried out. Some states um, like to review the drawings themselves. Some states will hire a third party um, approved agency to then review the drawings and give uh, the modular guys a go ahead. So, uh, on the modeler side of things, not only do the developer or the builder submits the drawings to the city, but then there is sort of this extra level of um, uh, pre-construction review that goes on at the state level as well. Um, and then uh, obviously individual cities might have their own zoning um, requirements or their own build requirements, and those are all tackled um, in the pre-construction uh, process as well. The design um, after pre-construction um, is pretty much locked in the modeler process uh, because these homes are built as a product or as components. And so after the pre-construction is done and the drawings are approved at the state level, um, the de design is pretty much locked. So any changes um, cannot be made or cost um, quite a bit to make those changes because you know, you're know you then having to go back and get all your permits again, if at all you've made a structural change. Um, step three would be construction, which from the modeler standpoint is going to be mostly manufacturing in the factory. Um, it actually only takes, depending on the factory, five to 10 days to be building these in the factory floor. However, um, when you talk to a modeler manufacturer or a modeler builder, you're going to hear numbers like, oh, it's going to take two to three months for us to deliver this. And most of that is just either waiting um, for your turn on the line, which is essentially every factory runs a backlog, especially after COVID, more and more people are looking at offset construction. So a lot of factories have a sizable backlog of product, which could be anywhere between two to four months. So um, you are essentially in line waiting for that. Um, and then the other big concern is also uh, materials, like depending on the windows, flooring, doors, cabinets you order, there might be a lead time associated with that as well. 
Brett, do you have a question? Yeah, Anker, um, I'm curious, and maybe you're going to get to it, so let me know, but between step one, two, and three, in the context of this session, we're talking about the DOE zero energy ready process. So there's that preliminary energy modeling that needs to get done. There's reviewing everything um, to make sure it's in compliance with the IECC. Uh, uh, I forget where they're at right now, um, maybe 2012. Uh, or 2015, really. Um, and then, of course, there's Indoor Air Plus, so there's those other items. So maybe you can give us a hint as to where those kinds of conversations come into these steps. Is like in pre-development, are you doing like some early energy models just to see if if it's on target or, you, you know, or maybe you're going to get to that, so. <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's an excellent question. And, and I think the answer is in terms of um, what are you building, right? So let's say you're building a custom home, which is going to have a lot of changes uh, in terms of design as you go through the pre-construction process. In that case, the pre-development is mostly just looking at zoning and the feasibility rough high level numbers, but most of your pre-construction um, is also going to involve um, energy modeling and, and those kind of things. So you would um, reach out to a, your preferred rater and they would be able to run an energy model uh, for you in pre-construction just to see whether you are going to be um, hitting the metrics you want um, just from a model perspective. Um, however, if you were standardizing your designs, which a lot of builders are now doing, they have standard plans that can kind of go together, um, sort of like Legos, they can be attached, detached, you know, in, in different kind of um, permutation and combinations. Um, in in that scenario, you can even do your pre uh, your pre construction energy modeling during the feasibility phase because the design essentially is not going to change as you go through pre construction. So most for the for the most part, um, it's a process that spans pre development and pre construction because a lot of um, designers in in my network as well would like to have a general idea of what they're um, going to spec before they enter pre-construction. Um, and I think DOE um, used to have till 2023 a prescriptive path uh, method to um, certify the homes as well. And that prescriptive path actually allowed you even in pre-development to use those metrics and pick your specs um, and your performance standards um, quite early on in the process. Now, um, moving forward, uh, the prescriptive path has given way to a performance path, um, which overall uh, makes the process much better. But I think even if folks want to kind of design their homes to 2022 or 2023 prescriptive path methods, that's probably a good place to just start and then um, run the performance path uh, process during the pre-construction process. And we do it all the time as well, um, because a, every year or every couple of years, yes, there are jumps in, in the Xenogy Ready code, but um, if you look at it over a decade, it's a significant jump. Over a year or two years, it's not as significant. So it's um, usually okay to be um, even working with something that was real last year, but then just updating it as you go through the pre-construction process to the most updated uh, performance metrics that come from your rater. So, so if I heard if I heard you correctly, um, the the Energy Star, well, really the the DOE zero energy already has the that IECC compliance path to whatever it is like fifteen or eighteen or twenty one. I and it depends on what your permit date is, right? So, yeah. so so you're saying focus on hitting that IECC target in the early development stage and then perhaps start getting the modeling done if you're on track with that in the pre-construction and later is that just to kind of summarize if I'm hearing that correctly yeah yeah that 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 pretty much um uh, I think explains it well um yeah. that that's a good starting point obviously every home or every project might be slightly different depending on the construction method and depending on the manufacturer you build with mm -hmm. so there will be tweaks, which is why the performance is uh, performance path is better because then you can you have um, you know you have sort of a give and take situation where some things um, can give you more points versus some things can can deduct some points and uh, 
and, and I'm not a rater. So again, um, that's something that I would recommend um, just running by your rater as well. But we have used that uh, process uh, successfully in the past. And it really helps to just know upfront because some of those upgrades can have uh, big implications on the, on the cost of the overall project. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, and then construction, um, all your inspections happen um, in the factory. Uh, all the inspections are related to the house itself. Uh, so all your rough end inspections happen in the factory. Uh, there are um, fire rating um, inspections and framing inspections that are required in some states and those can be done in the factory as well. Uh, once you bring the boxes to the site and they're installed on the foundations, uh, there is a bit of um, stitching work between the boxes, but then your finals actually happen on site. So most cities will want to do the final inspections, which would be electrical, plumbing, and HVAC, and then also um, accessibility inspections happen on site because um, the stairs and all of those things are completed in the factory. However, all the cosmetic stuff like railings and stuff like that are installed on site. And we can talk a little bit more about that on future slides. But in terms of the inspection process, that's where that happens. Um, for the DOE zero energy ready inspections, um, it is an ongoing process. So um, if you guys are familiar with different kinds of housing um, or different kinds of industrialized construction housing, there is uh, the panelized construction method where people bring panels or you, you ship panels to the site and the panels are put together to then do all the interior finishes on site. There is modeler, which is what we've been talking about, which is these, um, modular boxes or modules are completed in a factory. They're built to the international building code. Um, and then there is a different program for manufactured homes, which are um, which look similar to modular homes, but uh, they are built to um, hard standards. So hard has a separate um, building standard for uh, manufactured housing and those homes um, are currently, for example, built on a chassis and have their own um, energy efficiency um, standards and their own um, sort of uh, nationwide approved standards. Now, the advantage, um, there are advantage of uh, advantages of both modular and manufactured depending on your um, housing situation. Um, on From the zero energy ready perspective though, um, there is no separate program for the modular construction. There is, however, a separate program for manufactured homes. Um, so DOE has essentially two um, lines of these programs. One is for manufactured structures, which is the hardcore home, and one is uh, for the IBC, um, International Building Code um, construction, which is what modular will fall under. So we still have to follow that process, which means that the horse raters will be involved with us throughout the construction. They will come to the factory and they will inspect the insulation and uh, they will inspect how the how the framing is done, how the drywall is done, depending on what depending on the checklist they have. But all of these inspections then have to be coordinated on the factory level. Um, so the raters have to visit the factory and then take the right documentation that we can. Um, it'd be great to hear alternative um, approaches to this as well. Like I think there are a couple of um, rating providers here in the chat as well. And at the end of the session, if you guys have ideas around how to get around or work through that situation better, that'd be um, very helpful, I think, for the group in general to hear. Um, well, Ankur, that brings up some of the questions that maybe came in and maybe this is a good time to address them. But before we get to that, you know, I, I appreciate that clarification between, you know, modular and manufactured and how the DOE Zero Energy Ready program falls into it. Um, you know, if I understand, if I understand right, the, the manufacturing plants have to like successfully, you know, achieve zero energy ready on three homes, uh, not get them certified, but just, they could be certified. Right. And then, and then their plant has some kind of quality control process in place. And, but what you're saying is for modular, you're not following that path. If I understand correctly, you're still, you're following the traditional path, but you're having the rater in during the rough inspection uh, like they normally would be in a, in a, in a mid construction on site and then out on site. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, that is accurate. On the manufactured housing side, you can get the plant certified by certifying a fixed number of homes, but then you also have to have, um, 
sort of inspections throughout the year, um, which I think they pick at randomly, which homes to inspect, uh, but it's sort of like a continuous um, quality check process. Um, mm. For modular homes, however, we fall in the same category from ZRH perspective in the stick build home category. So we have to um, work with raters and get them in um, to like inspect at every stage of the project as well. It is kind of an extra step to be very honest from a modeler perspective. Um, yeah. And we have had some conversations with, with the folks who run the Zero Energy Ready program and um, they they were very interested in, in the issues we were raising. And if there is significant push from developers asking for that, um, they're confident that at some point there will be a specific program for modular. Um, yeah. However, that is not going to be the case for uh, right now. So for us, yeah. um, we're just getting into man our own manufacturing and we're going to start building our first home um, in April of this year. And so yeah. we're looking at different raters here who can sort of have a yearly um, engagement with us where they come in and inspect our homes and sort of an, uh, 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 on an as needed basis. Yeah. Um, and so it's a little bit hard because the model process goes so fast um, to be able to see everything. So we kind of have to be on our toes to make sure we schedule those things um, uh, in in the most um, efficient way that we can. But uh, I think that's kind of been um, how most modeler suppliers are, are dealing with that. Um, so how does that work with the Inflation Reduction Act money? Because if I understand correctly, the ma the manufactured housing pathway sort of sets it up so that the manufacturer can get those dollars. And then in theory, they either can use that money to reduce the cost or use that money to justify the increased cost or, you know, whatever that, that that's a whole nother thing. But they get the money. You don't have to worry about the 45L tax credit. But in this case, uh, who's getting that 45L tax credit? Uh, is it still going to you all? Do you have a basis in these projects? You know, how does that work? So... There are some, um, there are still some details of that program that that we as a team are trying to figure out. But um, at the base of it, uh, for us building modular housing, um, the tax credits are going to the developer. So in this case, on the screen, I mentioned housing provider. So it, it essentially goes to um, the housing provider um, because mm -hmm. most of these certifications um, kind of span outside of just the modular scope um, there is still a lot of um, little things that need to be done on site um, that mm -hmm. will fall or that will um, qualify you for the zero energy ready or energy star program um, so one example would be foundation the other one would be hvac a couple of these things are completed mm -hmm. on site um, and inspected on site and most of those things depending on who the developer is um, is on is on them to complete and so in this case they're getting um they are getting the benefit of that tax credit program uh, we have however worked with a few developers to try and figure out a good middle ground like if we are able to build a certified home for them um then there might be some shared um understanding of how that that credits might be disbursed to us beforehand or after they receive those um, credit. So I think there is a few different ways uh, that can be done. It comes down to your relationship and negotiation. But for the most part, on the modular side of things, the developers, so the people buying the land, putting up the financing, um, are able to get the benefits of those tax credits. Mm. Thanks. No problem. Um, so something that I wanted to uh, present uh, that has given us some success. Um, and I think we see more and more companies going this route as well, um, is uh, being essentially at the core of it, a design firm, um, design and engineering firm. And that's how we started out as well, but then slowly moving into um, construction and general contracting, and then eventually our own manufacturing as well. And a few companies um, on the East Coast and just around the country have taken this approach. Um, and why we feel there is a benefit to doing something like this is a lot of the modular manufacturers historically have um, had good design teams 
internally, but they've built uh, a more suburban or rural product. So a lot of them have built ranches and um, uh, capes. Um, but I think there is still um, a lot of work that can be done on the design side of things, because essentially um, when it comes down to it, um, the homes have to be easy to install and they have to be easy to inspect. And if those things aren't done at the right time, then um, that could create a lot of issues for the developer and uh, for the homeowners as well. Um, not to mention the contractors who are working on site, like the whole installation uh, process, um, because it goes so quick or in a day or in half a day, um, it is very important to get the design right. And so um, assembling a good core team of designers and engineers who understand the modeler process has been the core of many businesses um, that are now seeing some success. Uh, because they are solving for some very specific things that we can uh, that we will talk about as we go through this, um, and every problem essentially then becomes a design problem, whether it's during installation um, or it's during um, the actual operation of the house. Um, all of these things, because um, a good design team is able to think of those things super early on, um, it's much easier to make those changes then than after the fact. Um, and a big piece of this is just mapping out who all are involved in the process, not just the end user, uh, but uh, the inspectors, the installers, the on-site general contractor, and then you know, understanding the problems that those people face and then specifically solving for those through the design of the modular homes, um, which comes down to essentially speaking their language. I think um, a lot of developers and general contractors um, have not looked at modular yet or have looked at a project and then have a sore taste in their mouth just because they've had a bad experience, whether it's through communication or uh, the manufacturers not necessarily understanding um, their core issues. So solving for that has been a big part of what a lot of teams um, like ours are also working on right now. Um, so I'll give you an example of what that um, looks like, for example, um, a lot of homes, if you, if any of you have been um, on a set, uh, depending on the roof type that you may have, um, there is some considerable amount of work that needs to be done on site. A lot of homes have this roof structure folded on top of a box. And the reason they do that is for shipping height um, restrictions. Um, so every state will have their own shipping height restrictions. Usually it's around 14 feet um for most states and so to make sure your um box is not taller than that um the roofs are sort of folded on top of the box and um, and then shipped to site um now that does solve a logistic issue um however what it creates on site is you then have to lift that roof up uh while you're doing the set um and the only way you can do it on site is by using the crane that you have uh, for your set. Now, those cranes can run $500 to $1,000 an hour. So that's a very expensive roof lift that happens on site. One possible solution that we have explored um, to that is making the roof part of a livable space. So we added a third story to a lot of our homes um, or incorporate the roof as part of the second story. And then what that allowed us to do is just um, eliminate all that waiting and installation time on site, but then be able to just assemble the boxes like Lego blocks. So that is an example of how good design can solve some of the um, installation and sort of cost issues on site. Brett, do you have a question? Well, yeah, Ankar, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself in the context of zero energy ready and trying to pack as much insulation appropriately, you know, grade one install into a roof, good air sealing. What ways does this become a, a negative or a positive for that goal as well or nothing? Um, yeah, I think that really depends on whether that top floor or that attic space, for the lack of a better term in this scenario, is going to be occupied or not. Um, I think uh, depending on how you insulate that um, roof, you could have the insulation in the ceiling of that box or you could have it installed after the fact um, on your actual roof structure. Now that can be done 
um, to the levels required by Zero Energy Ready or Energy Star. However, that's just additional work on site and then additional inspection that somebody then has to look at. Um, however, in, in the scenario on the right, uh, all of that is done in a factory setting in a controlled environment with the same folks who, in, who did the insulation for the rest of the house. Um, that's what they do day in and day out on multiple projects. And so they get better and better over time installing the grade one insulation in any part of that home as well. Um, there will be some restrictions mm. sometimes depending on um, your condensation point studies or um, dew point studies, depending on the climate zone you're in, um, of how much insulation and where you put it. Um, and then some other things that come into the consideration is um, when you build a attic space that is livable, there will be um, some parts of that space, um, especially like if you see uh, on the picture on the right, like where those slopes are right at the bottom where that where, where you see that line of shingles, that space is essentially a dead space um, in that house. However, um, that space is a, in this house, um, uh, unconditional, like not conditioned, right? And so how do we make sure that we are essentially not creating a section through the house that, that could um, promote mold and stuff like that um, without compromising um, on the standards that we want. So where the insulation goes in that front piece is really, really important and how we essentially delineate our conditioned space, which is the house itself and the unconditioned space, which is outside of that floor you see there um, and in that slope uh, becomes really important. Now, without getting into details, I mean, um, how we solve for it here um, is essentially our insulation mode from um, the floor of that box to the ceiling of the box below. And then that gave us just a clear delineation of where um, our condition space ended. So I think that was one small thing that we could do to um, mitigate that part. But again, this, this comes as a learning through uh, building a few homes and you're not gonna get it right on the first one. So that's something that we've learned the hard way too and a lot of other manufacturers have as well is there is going to be incremental benefits of building the same house again and again and I think that's the approach that a lot of manufacturers are taking because they are standardizing these designs for that exact reason like the 10th version of their home is going to be very functional and, and extremely well performing compared to what they first built so there is a continuous learning process to this as well thanks no problem. Another thing is uh, just how do you manage standardization and, and design and how we see a lot of people doing it um, right now is um, essentially categorizing what custom means into certain categories like modern versus traditional, interior versus exterior finish, um, color palettes. Most people, and just in our experience, eight out of 10 people fit within one of those brackets as to what they look at as custom. And so um, making those things available upfront as options um, is always an easier process. Like for example, if somebody wants to change their kitchen, you the layout of the kitchen is fairly the same with maybe a couple of different small changes, but then you have different color palettes and different types of countertops or tiles that you can, can put in without essentially changing the um, core of that house is a much easier process from the modeler standpoint. Um, and standardization from that could also go to um, making some of those um, custom changes part of your standard designs as you move through the cycle of product development. Um, like a few things that we have been asked about um, or how we started out uh, was the Zero Energy Ready guidelines, the Energy Star guidelines, visitability on our first floors, having a half bathroom on our first floors. Now these were custom mass as we started the uh, process. However, going through building a few of these, these became part of the standard design because they just made an overall better product and better sense um, for an average home buyer. So making that as part of the base model just makes the process of manufacturing much easier for the manufacturer because then they know um, upfront what is coming and there is no last minute changes. 
Um, so something that I'm sure you all may have heard uh, about modular homes is, is there a way faster to build? Uh, I just wanted to put an example um, in front of everybody um, as to how, like, yes, they do get built faster because everything is under a controlled environment and you have all your, um, essentially your trades right there to make it work. But the, the biggest gain we get is, um, if you see on the screen on the left, um, as the excavation and foundations are going on, um, on a site built uh, method, you will not be able to start your, your framing until all your foundations are complete. But on a modular setting, um, you will be able to start your construction in the factory while you're doing your foundations and excavations on site. So there is a big overlap, it's about a couple of months that, that we're able to save right there. And then that essentially also adds on as we go forward because the box also arrives a lot more finished. Um, it's not just the framing, your drywalls on, flooring, kitchen cabinets, countertops, everything is in there. And so you save a lot of that time as well. And there, and we've released a couple of case studies, but one of them is for a three unit project here in Pittsburgh. Um, and that was compared to another three unit project, which was stick build. And so there was about, 172 days, it comes to about six months um, of savings. Now, that 445 day timeline looks like a lot of time. Um, and just to give you a little bit more context, um, that was during uh, the first COVID um, shutdowns as well. So that number obviously has come down significantly since then. Um, but yes, there were at least two to three months of um, shutdowns and supply chain delays that contributed to that, which is why we want to compare it to an exact sort of um, comparable, which would be a three home development. Um, and then in terms of energy efficiency, um, we work with our home buyers or end users. Um, and a lot of manufacturers do that is work with the end users to get um, energy performance data and uh, building those energy ready home uh, standard on, um, I think this data is based off of a uh, two-story, two-bedroom house. Um, and so there was um, about almost $1,600 per year um, of savings in the energy bill. Now, first of all, there is no gas in the house. So that's completely eliminated. And then uh, because you're building to a higher standard and also using all your appliances that are or that carry a certain certain certification, um, you are able to kind of slowly reduce your footprint and um, pay significantly less. And over a thirty-year uh, mortgage, that you know number in this case is about forty-six thousand eight hundred dollars, which could mean you could afford a bigger house or or a better house or a larger house, or that then goes to the um, home buyer and goes in their pocket for their other expenses. So there is um, just general um, equity that's created by building better as well. Um, um, go ahead. Brad. Real quick, Ankar, I'm just thinking of the 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 zero energy ready and some of the additional inspection time. Um, are is that 172 day average? Uh, assuming you know the additional um, time it might take to have those zero energy ready inspections or does that potentially further delay things? If you're just purely comparing a zero energy ready modular home versus a code built home that didn't bother with all those inspections. Yeah, yeah, I think this study actually included all of that um, inspection timeline as well. And you'll kind of see like in your vertical construction, the, the, the site built, um, row or the site build block is significantly longer than the modular block. And that mm -hmm. does not only include your supply chain and in-time deliveries and those mm -hmm. kind of things or weather delays, but that also include inspections because roughly half your inspections are completely eliminated or done at the factory. Um, and you're only doing your finals on site. There's no uh, waiting for the inspector to do rough ins. Mm -hmm. Most factories have um, state inspectors coming in almost every day or every other day to inspect the boxes on the line. So they don't really have to schedule an inspection and wait for inspection just because of the volume they're creating. So the inspectors are there all the time. And so that really saves time on site. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, that brings up another question. You know, we have 
50 states, 50 different rules. We have stretch codes in cities. So what, you know, hundreds of different building code rules out there. Does that mean if a modular manufacturer wants to serve multiple states or cities, they've got to have all of these different entities coming in and through, or is there someone who can put trust in a more national approach? So there, there are different aspects of that question. Uh, one is mm -hmm. the uniformity of code. Um, there, there is a version of um, of your ICC code. I think it's ICC MBI twelve hundred. Um, mm -hmm. That is uh, specific to modular construction. Uh, however, the only places that I know have adopted it is the state of Virginia and the, and the city of, I guess, Salt Lake City are the only two places that are actually adopted to a nationwide mm -hmm. code. Now, that has all happened in the last six to eight months. So right. even though yeah. that's a good step or the right mm -hmm. step, there is still 49 states to go. And so that is something that will happen slowly, I guess, um, because that involves a statewide um, government involvement. Um, however, on the other side of this is the is there are a few third parties which the states kind of contract mm -hmm. that are licensed uh, to do inspections in a lot of different states. Like a few of those parties are are licensed in like forty different states to do the inspections. So that might be a slightly uh, easier process. Um, to work with is uh, you can pick a third party inspector who is licensed in, in the states you want to build at and then they can work with you to figure out um, how to do how or figure out how to build in a certain um, city or a certain state. Um, some states will require internal reviews in addition to that third party, but at least it's a it's a more um, easier process when you're talking to one single person as opposed to talk to every single state. So for us to get our factory certified in, to be building in Pittsburgh, we have to also get certifications for every state we'll be delivering to. So in, let's say from Pittsburgh, we're delivering to New York. Uh, we have to submit our plans to the state of New York and the third party that they have licensed with as well um, to make sure that we're adhering to their um, requirements. Now, if all of these states decide to go and, and adopt the ICC standard, then it'll be um, much better and easier for the model manufacturers to deliver anywhere. Um, yeah. but that's going to take some um, some time, obviously. Do, do, and do those code inspection entities who serve multiple states typically also carry the, the zero energy rater so they can get that done at the same time? Or is that in addition to then? Yeah, it, it's very rare to find somebody who does both. I mean, I think yeah. most of the raters are, are their own independent thing. Um, yeah. They can always recommend you to somebody. Uh, but for the most part, they want to be as partial, impartial as possible, sorry, as impartial as possible to the inspection process. So they don't really want to deal with any other aspects of the homes other than just inspecting uh, the checklist that has been approved um, for that plant. Yeah. Um, and I also just wanted to put different examples of modular homes in front of everybody. There has always been a uh, misconception of sorts of the kind of homes you can build through modular construction and they're usually limited to ranches and capes however uh, a lot of different manufacturers have been very successful in in building two stories three stories uh, backyard adus um, um uh, homes on the shore homes on the lakeside um different different types of construction different types of foundation different types of um home ownership or, or rental programs. Um, and then all of these homes um, are built in a factory setting. So they are overall better. But then I think a lot of people, when they look at or think of modeler, um, I think for the most part, um, because of how the construction has happened in the past, they think of long boxy um, homes um, that deteriorate really fast or are flimsy. Um, however, now that's not the case. A lot of modular manufacturers and manufactured home manufacturers are building significantly better quality, offering better finishes than they used to before, um, and then also deliver a more finished product. Um, and just to give you guys an idea of roughly, you know, what the different stages of a project might look like, and these are pictures from a dif from different projects, but generally give an idea. Like on on the bottom left, you have your foundations going in, which also a lot of manufacturers or builders like us 
um, prefer a prefab method for that as well. Um, and then once your foundations are done is the set day where you put all your boxes together. So the next two pictures are off the set day. Um, you can see kind of the crane um, being right next to a busy street. And I think that's another benefit of Modeler is instead of going, um, you know, six months um, or having six months of disturbance to your immediate surroundings, it's one or two days um, of hassle, but but you're pretty much um, done after that. So the neighbor impact is fairly low. And then after that, you have to do some of your finishes, which in the top right picture is the roofing and the siding that still needs to be done there. Um, and then the picture to the left of that, which is top center is addition of a porch. So all uh, these modular homes, you can add any kind of accessories. Some of them can even be done in the factory, but we just have preferred doing them on site uh, for different reasons. Um, but porches, decks, garages, any of those things can be added onto the house. Um, and the most important one, top left, you get a really finished house. You can see the flooring's already in, cabinets are in, countertops are in, your fixtures are in, and that box is not even on the site. That is a picture from when it is in the factory. If you look out the window, you can actually see more boxes in the background. Um, so this is how finished um, the, the box looks um, once it's done in the factory. So you're getting a much finished product much faster. And then for all the developers and designers out there, these modular boxes can be put in any sort of combinations to then um, build a whole development as well. And some of these uh, developments are planned by manufacturers like us and other people in Pittsburgh and in other cities as well. Um, so they are a really um, efficient way of, of just making sure we um, uh, can build faster and can build to the same standardized step, standardized specifications that we have for any project. Um, one last thing, uh, one last section that I can go through quickly. I know we're coming up on time, um, but uh, the big piece of Modeler has been, a uh, big issue with Modeler has been that a lot of times the factories are located in um, remote areas uh, or there might not be a factory near you. And so the city uh, and the state, if they are funding a local project, are always skeptical of jobs being outsourced or uh, construction being outsourced and their, their dollars essentially being spent on something that's not being done in their jurisdiction. Um, so a new idea that a lot of manufacturers are now adopting is, is having sort of these satellite factories um, in different um, cities that are more uh, focused on just... Um, uh, cosmetic work and we have adopted that approach as well and we call it the last mile network uh, but essentially what that approach looks like and in some countries like Japan and Sweden have perfected this is have a regional uh, production hub which builds all your basic building blocks and then have a last mile facility in the region you want to build at which does all the final finishes um, and then obviously these things get delivered on site and um, why this is better we'll just, I just have a quick slide at the end of this as well, where we'll talk about that. Um, but essentially, this ramp up plan is divided into three different phases. One is to assess what your local workforce is like. So um, work with the local trading part, uh, trading um, institutes, trade institutes, sorry, and your local um, workforce partners to figure out um, what are the gaps in the current workforce or what would be the best source and the most efficient source to get the workforce you want and then have a small scale facility to test your ideas. This picture in the back um, is Trade Institute of Pittsburgh uh, working on a backyard ADU home here in Pittsburgh um, in a small facility. Um, phase two would be a much larger space that can actually build at scale um, to, uh, you know, 200 units per year is just something that we think Pittsburgh is going to be able to afford. But um, depending on the capacity in every city, um, that could bring uh, multiple jobs um, and also involve a lot of the performance and energy use testing in-house. And we can work with lower local providers to set that up. Um, and then phase three would be several of these factories working with each other. So you get the benefits of scale, but then you can also work with each other to fill any gaps in the pipeline. So let's say this year you didn't have enough or the same business you had last year and you have some gaps in your pipeline, you can fill that by working with other factories in the network uh, by building some of their homes. So overall as a network, this works really well and makes the whole ecosystem um, kind of work towards a better uh, product. 
Um, so some of the general benefits, obviously, uh, short manpower shortage, uh, the training in the initial small factory or in, in your um, ramped up factory as well would contribute to adding more folks to the line. And then that would help with the manpower shortage. Um, and then cities can do more locally. They can hire local labor. They can spend the money um, in local communities and, and do the work um, closer to their um, people as opposed to you know being um, significantly outside um, their system uh, or their network of contractors. Uh, more flexibility in contextual design because you can standardize the basic building blocks, but then you will still have the flexibility um, in those local factories with your design and your um, um, local workforce to build the product that's more suited for that region, whether it's type of countertop, flooring, or siding, or anything like that. I think there is a little bit more flexibility. And then the last one I think I already mentioned, which is the gaps in the pipeline. It just makes for a better supply chain experience overall. Um, so I think that that's pretty much it from me. Um, I know we were a couple of uh, minutes uh, over, but uh, would appreciate any any questions that people have and uh, my contact information, uh, my email is up on the screen as well. Um, feel free to reach out. We are always looking um, for uh, people to learn from and then also um, work on excited, exciting projects that any of you guys might have. And so um, any of those emails are welcome. We will also be officially launching our first project in the Pittsburgh space in our in our Pittsburgh manufacturing uh, in the May April May time frame. Um, so if any of you are interested in in um, touring our facility at that point, um, we can add you to the mailing list, and then you guys can can get updated with those dates as well. Um, but thank you, and uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Well, thanks, Ankur. Um uh if if we can stay over a little bit and answer some questions if you got some time here and um before we get into those questions just real quick as a reminder uh this session is being recorded it is available it will be available up on our youtube channel so you can check back there in the next couple of days uh or go there now and click subscribe and you'll receive an instant update when it is available um for those of you watching this in the future not right now uh, head over to our Thinkific page or GBCI page and take your quiz with an 80% passing rate to receive your continuing ed. For those of you here today, make sure to check your spam at certs at gutenbergcerts.com. And as long as you've been appropriately logged in and here for the entire CU hour, uh, you'll receive your certificate and make sure you take the survey that pops up at the end or that's sent to you when we close out. And before we get to those questions, again, a huge thanks to our board of directors, all of our volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reyna, and our top tier sponsors who are helping uh, even modular manufacturers hit uh, zero energy ready, such as Rheem and Mitsubishi with many of their air source heat pump technologies for heating water, heating the air. Big thanks to them and all who support our work. Um, so, Agar, I, I think one of the questions that came in was just about um, uh, you know being able to choose different wall assemblies, different energy efficiencies in wall assemblies. Um, you know, I'm assuming that's something that you you're able to do. But can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. I, different wall assemblies are def are definitely possible. I think we also use that as a means of standardization in terms of um, you know sort of having a good better. Uh, best product as well. So you can kind of go up from your standard wall assembly um, to a higher and a higher performing assembly. Uh, other things that can be incorporated in a factory setting are also systems like you guys may have heard of force field or um, zip system. Those all can be done in a factory setting as well. In terms of um, your standard wall assemblies, like we standardize it as a two by six uh, wall with uh, fiberglass insulation, and then we insulate the whole house with extra within one inch or two inch um, EPS or XPS. But we've also seen people do sort of staggered walls with um, extra insulation or just zip sheathing on the outside. Um, and then we've also seen people using an R zip product. So there are different assemblies that you can pick, and um, that does not necessarily, uh, or the factory doesn't necessarily restrict you. Um, 
from building any of that. Uh, a lot of times, however, if you when you go to any factory, it's always beneficial to ask them upfront, like the different kind of assemblies they already offer, because that would uh, be a much easier process uh, for for you to go through in terms of price and design, because mm -hmm. they might already have those things designed, and they will also probably give you a preferential price for that if they don't have to build something custom. Mm -hmm. And what about um, air sealing? You know, so the question here kind of is just, could you highlight some of the challenges for air tightness, air sealing targets, especially between uh, marriage walls, between modules? You know, how does that maintain integrity during shipping? Can you just speak a little bit to that? That's an excellent question. So I think if you if you see a product that's delivered from the factory, um, it is super finished. However you still need to make box to box connections mm -hmm. and um, you still need to finish any of the um, areas that are at the seams, so to speak. So your stairs typically fall there or your exterior, um, mm -hmm. where your exterior, uh, where your insulation and siding is supposed to go on top, uh, kind of fall in that category. So how we solve for that is we have a pretty exhaustive checklist that we go through mm -hmm. once the home is set um, to essentially go and make sure we, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cover all the openings we we caulk wherever we can and then uh, we install uh, uh, extra insulation wrap on top of any of the seams if that has to be done prior to siding we always do that and that's part of our qaqc checklist process um we have a in terms of let's say a blow door test um we even without like trying too hard we've seen a lot of modular homes uh, be between two and three ACH at 50 pascals, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, quite good in terms of um, somebody who's just built to that standard and, and hasn't even like focused too much on making those things better. We have seen a few manufacturers even achieve 0. 0.6, which is which which has been a, a uh, sort of a limit for passive house as well for a while. Um, but those things then require you to do incremental um things on your process and a lot of times the manufacturer in the factory is not able to do that because they're essentially giving you components of a house and so whoever's putting them together on site kind of brings that last 10 percent or 20 percent of that performance in uh, by having an exhaustive qaqc checklist which a lot of raters are super helpful with they can help you um set up those checklists as well for things to look at when these boxes arrive on site we recently just created one because we had a rater on our set and then he looked at the box in the conditions they were and then gave us essentially, I think there were 9.9 .9 line items that uh, we had to have on our checklist. And so when you go through the initial tie up process of your boxes, you kind of uh, go through them one by one and that um, ensures you have a better envelope overall. Well, and that's, you know, that was segued into another question here is, you know, being able to hit the passive house targets. And what I hear from you is maybe those passive house targets, there's a lot that goes into that, but it sounds like it's the air sealing component. Really, if someone wants passive house, they would need to complete uh, on site during the final. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, with passive house, there are a lot, there's a lot, there's just one example. There's a lot more that needs to be considered. Um, yeah. There is a lot more of, uh, consideration given to your your site conditions in passive house um and and i think zero energy ready uh is also slowly headed that way but for now it's more based on the climate zone you're in um but passive house just opens um a whole other possible like a whole, a whole other set of possibilities for you to explore with modular mm -hmm. construction we uh, i cannot necessarily speak to that because uh, we've only done one passive house project our first one was actually passive house and that was Panelized, not modular. Mm. Um, uh, but mm. I'm sure there are people out there um, who build modular passive houses as well. Yeah. Um, so, and then obviously a big part of that is hitting the heating and cooling targets. And so we didn't talk a lot about HVAC here. We talked a lot about the assembly. So some quick, you know, questions on HVAC uh, that came in here. Um, I guess, what do you typically using your all electric. So I assume it's heat pumps. Is it ducted, ductless, ducted mini splits? What kind of systems are you typically using? So especially with the new dash dryers, like everything we're using um, is heat pump based. Uh, the, the default 
system that we have um, or systems that we have. We have one um, preferred system, which is the mm -hmm. mini split on the mini split side of mm -hmm. things um, with a particular manufacturer. And then we have a ducted system uh, with another particular manufacturer. Um, from a purely modular standpoint, uh, mini splits are much easier to install. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, your refrigerant lines can either go through chases mm -hmm. or just through the wall outside. Um, and duct work is a little bit more involved. However, it comes down to personal preference of the developer as well. Like, do you, they want to see um, units on the wall or, mm -hmm. you know, once you start getting into sort mm -hmm. of um, units inside the wall mm -hmm. that are mini split, like the cost kind of starts getting a little bit on the higher side. So for the most part, we give these two options mm -hmm. to customers. Like, do you want a mini split on the wall system versus a ducted system? Mm -hmm. um, but you, it's just, because there's no duct work in the mini split system, we also traditionally tend to get better performance from those systems. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Well, yeah, no, and 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 um, what about on the ventilation side? There were some questions on how you're hitting the ventilation requirements. You know, we've got local ventilation, whole home ventilation, and then of course the you know the um, kitchen you know has to be properly ventilated even with electric. So how are you all? achieving that in the kitchen we usually have um hoods or recirculating microwaves however the the major part of circulation um in in our houses is an erv system now depending on the house so the size of the house we might use mm -hmm. one of those spot ones that go on the wall or in in the in your ceiling mm -hmm. and they yep. just are basically for a let's say three four hundred square feet amount of space mm -hmm. um, we will also work with larger ducted systems that can integrate with our um hvac system that we already have and so um those are the ones that we typically have used we haven't used like a whole house fan or anything like that yet but ervs typically um because i think you mentioned them as one of your sponsors as well panasonic has been one of our um specification of choice as well um, because they offer like different based on the size of the house you have different options essentially so i think that's kind of been our approach there okay um and when you're doing you know it sounds like the if you're taking the decentral approach right mini splits uh uh, uh um, the sort of on the wall ervs that's great. But I guess my question is when you're doing ducted systems, are those being done in the factory or are those being done on site? So we have been trying to do more and more in the factory. So we'll run all of our ducts in the factory. Okay. We will even place um, our system inside the house in the factory. However, there will be connections between the boxes um, and then also connections to your outdoor units that need to mm -hmm. be made on site. Uh, but all of the chases and everything are pre-planned in your design mm -hmm. phase, in your pre-construction phase. And then mm -hmm. all of your ductwork, uh, your thermostat, um, and the unit itself can be put in place mm -hmm. in the factory. Mm -hmm. It's just not connected to anything. Okay. So how is your HVAC commissioning taking place? Is that sort of a strategic uh, collaboration between the on-site and uh, well, in the in factory and on site, and getting that commissioning done appropriately per per the Energy Star requirements. Yeah. So what we did is we actually went out to the manufacturers uh, of both those uh, systems, and we said uh -huh. like, hey, we're going to be doing these things in a factory, um, and uh, how do we make sure that we're able to work with on site contractors to have a smooth transition? Now, a lot of these manufacturers uh you know panasonic mitsubishi and and others they all have a good network of subcontractors in every region um that they that they can deliver their product and so they were able mm -hmm. to work with us to figure out the exact scope that an on-site contractor could be doing and because the mm -hmm. contractor was being referred by the manufacturer themselves mm -hmm. a reduced scope didn't really deter them mm -hmm. plus uh, the the idea of doing a lot of that install in a local factory, like some of these local subcontractors will actually be able to come to our factory space here and do the initial setup as well, in addition to doing the work on site. So that's a future um, scope of work that we are working out with them is, is how to do that. Um, but mm -hmm. then the the promise of scale is there for everybody. Like I think what they're looking for is, is mm -hmm. it's more business. So if we can provide them with a consistent supply of, you know, if we can build 50 homes a year, they're doing the on-site install 
on 50 homes a year, they're more than happy to work with us and try and figure out, you know, what the limited scope would be for them to do on site. And then, however, they pull the permits and they get the inspection. So the, all of that is kind of on them, on the on-site subcontractor for HVAC. Um, and then, you know, that kind of segues into the, you know, and, uh, some questions that were coming up about the sort of consistency of the rater, right? Because, you know, we have a rater in that sort of pre-construction preliminary phase sort of doing the modeling. Then you have someone in the factory and then you might have someone on site, which you, you could be pretty far away, right? So is there, a, 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 I guess, a collaboration between that preliminary modeling rater, the person who comes into your factory, and then the person who's on site, like a handoff, I guess, is that something that's set up? Absolutely, and I think um, somebody in the chat mentioned that too, um, is how they have done it. So depending on how far the factory is, you know, we've contract manufactured with factories that are 60 miles away versus 200 miles away. So 60 miles away is a half a day uh, you know, tri trip mm -hmm. back and forth for somebody. And we've had just our rater here, go do that. If it's mm -hmm. 200 miles away, then they, with our help, find somebody local and then they're able to share information between them. Uh, we just have to make sure that they're both certified um, and they're mm -hmm. both up to date with the, with mm -hmm. the building information. Um, but that's how we have done it. When we do it mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh, it's just going to be a local rater because we're right here. Um, right. However, um, yeah, definitely. If the distances are, I want to say, if the if if it's not if it's more than a day's worth of back and forth, you definitely want to find somebody local to the factory to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, there's questions about you know this resiliency in construction, right? And and so one of the specific questions was you know, hey, can you build with ICF, insulated concrete forms, or how can you intercheck? But I want to ask a broader question than that, and really just how are you addressing resiliency? You mentioned climate change issues at the beginning. You know, we do, I know for our Green Star program and other programs, we require climate resiliency studies of the ultimate site of where the home is being set and how you might resist certain issues that are coming, flood, rain, wind, tornado, hurricanes, um, if someone wants to build additional resiliency, maybe ICF is part of that. I don't know, but how are you all addressing that? Is that question coming up? You know, what are your thoughts there? So, well, luckily or unluckily, we haven't yet built in an area which has an extreme of any of those things like tornadoes or flood or anything like that. However, mm -hmm. we have worked mm -hmm. or we have worked with partners who have built in those areas, people who build on the shore, mm -hmm. uh, people who build, um, you know, kind of in uh, in the uh, Kentucky, Tennessee area where there are a lot of like tornadoes. Mm -hmm. um, the feedback we've gotten from them is because mm -hmm. the modular homes are essentially designed to the same standards as a stick build home, the same considerations that go in for the stick build homes are also taken into account uh, when you do a regular um, modular constructed home. So your lateral loads for your wind or your live loads for mm. heavy snow and anything like that, mm. it's the same exact standard. Um, if anything, it's scrutinized mm. twice, once at the state level, once at the city level. So there are sort of fail safes to, to check that process. So if any region you're able to build a stick build home, you'll be able to do um, a modular home as well. Um, in terms of trying to make the this work with um, stuff like ICF, um, that's a very specific mm. question. And, 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 you know, it might be specific to your site. Modular uh, construction may not be conducive to all sites. Um, and one very kind of on a tangent example of that is also like cities that are tight with like skinny streets. Um, this box is 16 feet wide and to be able to and 50 feet long to be able to, you know, go through cities and make that turn is always hard. So I don't think modular is a solution that fits all, um, but there are other forms of industrialized construction like panelized and other things. Like a lot of panel companies are are actually focused on um, resiliency um, and people can reach out to me and I can also share a couple of examples of folks who I may have met at conference and other places who are building homes in those specific locations for tornadoes and other things like that. So I've seen a lot of success on the panelized construction side for that kind of stuff because panels are... Um, a single component, but they're a lot more flexible uh, from that perspective. Uh, but for an average home builder or home buyer, 
Um, anything you can do stick build, you can also do modular. Um, what about embodied carbon? Um, so, uh, or life cycle analysis, you know, there's certainly focusing on operational carbon, getting that down with energy efficiency, but now we're sort of starting to turn our attention to the carbon that goes into the construction of our homes and multifamily buildings. And, you know, that's, you know, the construction itself and all the materials that are selected. So how does modular, you know, either make that harder or, or, you know, easier, or have you, have you had any thoughts on how embodied carbon might play a role in what you do? The only studies we have done is uh, so far is the actual um, energy performance, which is more from a cost perspective, but then also um, the overall construction process uh, with a lower amount of logistics, lower number of trucks coming to the site every day, um, mm -hmm. you know, less um, energy being used on every single site as opposed to concentrating that in a factory. So those are sort of the low hanging fruits of that mm -hmm. conversation. And that's kind of where we are. We, we have been mm -hmm. starting some studies with Carnegie Mellon here and a couple of other consultants on the actual embodied carbon of each of our homes, um, which would then give us a, an exact number as opposed to just, you know, the talking points. And mm -hmm. so stay tuned for that, I guess, over the next few right. months. Yeah, I was gonna say we'll we'll have to have you back out when you get that one done. So I'm I'd be I'd love to hear more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, yeah, sure. if it looks good, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and if anybody's in the chat who who um, does those kind of studies, then we're all um, open to having um, a conversation, and uh, it's definitely something that we're going to focus on over the next twelve to twenty four months. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, um, Ankur, we are at our time and I really appreciate you staying over a little bit longer and just really explaining all of this to us and helping us understand better. Um, just as a reminder, where can people go to either contact you or learn more if they want to reach out? I think uh, general information about modular homes and what we do, our website, we have a blog section uh, where we have invited other folks from the industry as well uh, and have some general information that's not marketing materials, so to speak, about modular construction, energy efficient construction. Um, any other specific questions or you want to uh, come to Pittsburgh, meet us, schedule a tour um, of one of our homes, uh, you can reach out directly to me um, through my email and uh, we can definitely set something up. Uh, for anybody who wants to have a tour of the manufacturing facility, we won't start our manufacturing process here in Pittsburgh for at least another couple of months. So maybe reach out during the summer and then we can set something up. Um, but for every other questions, yeah, you can shoot me an email and I'll I'll respond. All right. Well, Ankur, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to Module and um, take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everyone.